So, over the past few weeks, with the loss of Reverend Allen, the loss of Tony last Sunday, the shooting of young Tyler, and a friend who had a stroke and three subsequent surgeries. There have been so many challenges that have been going on, and it really caught my attention that we have to get into the habit of experiencing the now. Learning to be present in the moment because in any given moment, things change. And sometimes we need help in learning to be present and not be so hard on ourselves. With that in mind, I decided to turn back to The Power of Now with Eckhart Tolle, one of the best books ever written. And in that book, he talks about critical factors that impact our spiritual growth. One is the difference between listening from here and listening here, and how much this gets us in trouble. So making that journey from head to heart, learning to become the observer of our thoughts and what's going on in our head, and also recognizing the greatest empowerment we experience is actually in the present moment. He does an excellent job of talking about how our minds are constantly sabotaging us. And you remember what I said about our thoughts, right? That 90% of them are negative. 75% of the negative are repetitive. So what are the chances you're thinking good things right now? Every day. So the mind does that, but we aren't our mind. And that is a point he tries to make throughout this. We aren't our thoughts. He explains that the body is constantly receiving false messages that indicate we're in danger or that we should be fearful, whether that's of loss or failure, being hurt. People don't enter relationships because they don't want to be hurt again. They're afraid to go places because what if? And he says, as long as we continue to identify with what goes on up here instead of what goes on in our heart, we are constantly going to let our ego run our life. And one of the best examples he shares in it is about how our ego is this driver of our compulsive need to be right. Now, I know that doesn't apply to anybody here. None of you have ever wanted to be right. I'm certain of that. Right. Um, but the truth is, we do it, he says, because being wrong is too much for our ego to handle. So we're constantly trying to prove ourselves right. And he makes this great point about and I have to read it to you. I wrote it exactly as he said it because I couldn't have said it properly. He says, once you have disidentified from your mind, whether you are right or wrong will make no difference to your sense of self at all. So the forcefully compulsive and deeply unconscious need to be right which is a form of violence, will no longer be there. And yes, that's what he said. That the need to be right is a form of violence and sabotage on ourselves. He says it's our deep unconscious need to push for something that isn't always accurate. And that once we stop identifying with this and do more listening, that we will be freer and will be able to state how we feel without proving that we're right. We can just speak 
freely, he says, without that aggressiveness, without that defensiveness, when we come from our heart. And he says our sense of self then comes from this truer place, this deeper place, this more meaningful place than our head. And he gives us this exercise for learning how to observe ourselves. He says if we just could get in the habit to observe ourselves and mark down or make note of how often we are defensive or aggressive and just monitor that, He says, if we start to observe the behavior, we will attempt to identify what we are defending besides some image in our mind that our mind created. I just want to restate that so we're all on the same page. So what he's saying to us is be the observer of those defensive moments, those aggressive moments, when your response is to fight back And then ask yourself in those moments, what are you defending? So think about that. Let's just take a simple example. So if you're arguing with someone over the right way to do something, oh no, we don't do it, we shouldn't do it that way. We need to do it this way. What exactly are you defending? That isn't a thought opinion. It's really just an opinion. So he says that that need to do that just gives more fuel to our mind to constantly be driving that compulsiveness. The more we become aware of the pattern, the more we observe it, the less we will be connected to it. And it goes back to what we talked about about a month or two ago, that witness consciousness, being the observer above ourselves, trying to see what's going on and saying, ew, what was that? Without identifying with it to the place of making ourselves feel badly. The more likely we do that, the more we do that, the more likely we are to end all arguments and power games that we play with each other that hurt and ruin our relationships. Toll describes power this way. The power over others is weakness disguised as strength. True power is what we have within us, and it's available to us in any given moment. Now, our mind can can and will wreak havoc on our life and prevent us from just being. How many of you find yourself never able to be? Just be. Come on, I know I'm not alone. How's, how much do we struggle with, oh, I've got 10 extra minutes. What can I fill in that 10 extra minutes? Okay, we're not good at just being, which causes us so much stress and anxiety. He points out, and this is a fact, folks, that all of our suffering comes from the thoughts in our mind, not from our being. The less time we spend in the practical aspects of our life, the daily nonsense, as I would call it, the less pain we're going to experience. And he talks about our life situations not being our life. He said they are situations, but they aren't who we are because They are based on psychological time, and psychological time is past and future. It is never present. So when you think about it, everything that's happening already happened. Usually we're halfway past it, and we're still carrying on about it. So when do we just learn to be and appreciate what we have in this given moment, without the defensiveness, without the aggressiveness, and without all that anger and anxiety that we continue to carry. He says our lives, our life, hasn't always gone the way we expected, so we resist. Whatever happened in the past, and then we resist where it led us to today. 
Then we use hope to focus on the future. While we're resisting, and oh, by the way, while we're resentful. Our lives are this perpetual cycle of looking back, resisting the now, and resenting what has happened. And then plotting how we're going to change this experience should we find ourselves in a similar situation. It's completely nuts what we do to ourselves. It is. It's backward and forward, and what should I do next, and what if I see them again? You know, I found myself, I'd only written half my talk prior to um, the service yesterday, so of course last night I was writing the other half, and as I was, I was kind of glad it worked out that way because as I was writing the other half, I was realizing how even yesterday for a whole minute, I was future tripping and I felt it. And as soon as I recognized it, maybe because I'd written the first half of this talk and it was fresh in my mind, I was able to ground myself and center myself again. But you know, when I first came up here yesterday to speak and I saw all the people, and of course I see Debbie and Jason and Marilyn and the kids, I had nine ministers, <laughs> right? And I realized I'm doing the service for my friend of 25 years, Alan. And it all just came rushing up, and I felt like I was just going to burst out crying and sit back down because I couldn't get in the moment. As soon as I saw it, felt it, looked at everybody and thought, oh, crap, what am I going to do now? Sorry, but that's what I thought. Um, I realized, okay, moment, be in the moment. What did you come here to say? What did you want to share? And how do you heal yourself by sharing what you want to talk about? Then it was peace. And I got in my groove. I didn't feel the need to cry. I wasn't going to panic and run out the door. And I settled down. I could just be. And from that moment on, all I did was hear every word people said, Alan said, and I was just so at peace. Even though I felt such emotion at times, I was able to be at peace because I wasn't thinking about, you know, at one moment, and at that same moment, I thought, I've got to keep that, this thing on track. You know, there are all these speakers, and people are going to want to leave. And, and I thought, I told Jan this morning that I realized, sorry, I hid my Kleenex in my pocket, my sleeve. Um, um, I told Jan this morning, I realized I didn't care if people needed to leave. It was fine. I wasn't going to rush this day. 84 years, an hour and a half is hard to get it all fit in. 84 years years. How do you describe that? So then everything went fine. But that anticipation that we have, that cycle that we get into, is what really causes us to have anxiety and unnecessary stress. So I want to ask you, how many of you have to-do lists? Come on. Okay. So we all have these to-do lists, right? And those lists, as we're making them, define in our heads how much time we need for each. Correct? So we don't just make a list in the moment of what we have to do in the future. We're also trying to figure out how much time they're going to take. Then we find ourselves trying to group them. Could I accomplish this and this at the same time? Can I, you know... Get two birds with that one stone concept. If there are errands on the list, we start to map them out. How much can I do if I go to the west side and if I go to the east side? All this mapping and mental craziness. But if we just thought about it and we could take a different approach, we would simply set our intentions, write down what we need to be doing, not worry about the strategy till we're actually ready to do it. 
which would be a little more in the present moment, and then we would just complete what needed to be done. But we are so programmed to get ahead of everything, get ahead, get ahead, get ahead, and then look back, look back. You know, I, I find that all of us, and uh, this is my, my point to you, is that we just spend so much time preparing ourselves for what we need versus uh, in the future versus what we need in the moment. Just what we need in the moment. And the biggest problem is not celebrating anything we finish. The minute we accomplish uh, anything, and Ellie and, I, Ellie and I actually talked about this indirectly yesterday. Both of us, the minute that service was over and all the people were gone, what did we do? How did it go? Did we do the right thing? How does it work out? Right? Reflect. It was all over. We should have just been dancing in the streets with what we all pulled off yesterday. Seriously. And the joy that I felt once again realizing it didn't matter it didn't matter what mattered is that we all felt really good about our parts that's all that mattered and that we served the people who needed healing too but that glory that we don't allow ourselves we work so hard to accomplish things and we immediately start pointing out our flaws what didn't look right, we could have done better, oh, I should have added this, why didn't I call so-and-so? We're always second-guessing instead of celebrating. And for me, it's exhausting. It's exhausting because it's nothing more than lack of self-awareness and lack of self-love. If we loved ourselves and we had the awareness we would celebrate everything, even completing dinner and cleaning it up would be a celebratory moment instead of I better hurry up and clean up because I've got 50 things to do, which often is the case. How many people eat and don't even remember what they ate? I'm serious. You, it's so crazy that we can't be in the moment. But without that self-awareness, we start to drown in our own thinking. We need to grow ourselves spiritually and then operate at that higher level of consciousness we need where it's a little simple, simpler without disowning ourselves and our thoughts. A philosopher, you may have heard of him, Jadu Krishnamurti is his last name. When there's, he said, when there is a division between the observer and the person being observed, there is conflict. But when the observer is the observed, there is no control and no suppression. The self comes to an end and duality comes to an end and conflict comes to an end. And he says the greatest thing we can come upon is this extraordinary thing for the mind to discover for itself that the observer is the one being observed. It's one and the same. The bottom line from my perspective is that our ego doesn't care about the now unless it is showing us the now through the lens of the past or trying to convince us to go and project the future. That's the only thing our ego knows how to do. Blah, 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 blah in the back, and blah, blah, blah about the future. Now, here's an example. So I was thinking, what if you wanted to increase your monthly income? And all you can see is the reality of what you've been able to earn in the past or how limited you are by the projections you have of the future. Now think about that for a minute. So it goes something like this. None of you have ever had that. Um, geez, I need more money to pay my bills. Well, I'm not going to make more money at my current job. And 
My history has proven I'm never going to go over a certain limit. So before you know it, you're saying I'm too old, I'm too inexperienced, I'm lacking the needed education, blah, 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 blah. All we have to do is take action in those moments. Just do something different than what you normally do. Stop thinking it through. Just do something. What would you do? And then if you take action, if you don't take action, everything your mind is telling you is going to come true. Nope, you're not going to make more money. You're not going to become happier. You're never going to afford anything. Or you're not going to have the circumstances in your life change. You're constantly programming that. That's the reality you're going to live. So the key is to engage your mind in a useful way. Find a solution that has nothing to do with the past or the future. And focus on what you can do right now. What can you change right now without fear for looking back or looking ahead? Freedom from our thoughts is as simple as watching them come in and go out and learning about how we think and how we operate in that process. And nothing will change if we don't help ourselves and if we don't do something different than what we've always done. So I'm going to leave you with three questions before we look at our takeaways. How tired are you of being disappointed in yourself, with yourself, and your efforts. How long will it take you to love yourself? And how willing are you to make some serious changes in your life? Let's look at today's lessons. So, number one, stop letting your ego run your life and listen to your heart instead. Number two, Release fearful thoughts. Neither the past nor the future matter. Practice just being, because this is where freedom truly exists. And focus on present moment actions. And you will give your best always. Our affirmation today is, I am experiencing the power of now. Let's say that together. I am experiencing the power of now. And Eckhart Tolle's quote for us today is, I am not my thoughts, emotions, sense perceptions, and experiences. I am not the content of my life. I am life. I am the space in which all things happen. Let's take that in for a moment. And so we pause now to reflect upon the importance of learning to understand ourselves, to become more self-aware, to love ourselves more, to celebrate all the good that we already do, to stop looking back, stop looking ahead, and be grateful for the now. And so it is. Amen.